And Simon, it was interesting, the new Forbes football rich list. Yeah. Um, it's been revealed Manchester United with a wealth of uh, 3.5 billion yeah. uh, 3.05 billion <coughs> not <coughs> out of the top three in terms of being the top three most valuable clubs in the, in the world they, yes they've gone from three to fourth uh, it's a general question from me to you in the yeah. boardroom <coughs> is there is there an atmosphere of arrogance when it comes to club wealth um yeah, of course there is. There's an uh, an, an, uh, an attitude of elitism about anything you are the biggest and best at. If you're valued at the best, you know, why do people run around wanting to be in the Sunday Times rich list? Mm. Because it, and, and people actually campaign for it. I was one of the exact opposite. When I got put in the Sunday Times rich list at 712 about 20 years ago, I was horrified to find myself there because it's, that's private. But in the football world, there's an element of badge of honour about it. I, th this Forbes rich list is a year out of date, by the way. It's from, 19, it's from 1920 i.e. from the year 2019 to 2020, so we're now in the middle of 2021, so we're talking about historic events, and of course it would be kind of laughable because we've all been saying how broke Barcelona are, that they've moved to the top of the list. Yeah, um, well, it doesn't square, but does it, it? But it's about what it's worth in terms of the principal value of it, and a whole raft of calculations are built into it, and they don't make a lot of sense, quite frankly, because I looked at it, Deloitte's do a football rich list, and I can understand because they've got more information about what they're doing and have got a track record of it. Forbes is just about prima facie, looking at what they think things are worth. And they're basing upon what they're basically doing is they're saying the clubs, the way we value clubs is not how much money you make, how much money you bring in. So we will then do that as a multiple. So we, whatever you bring in, if your turnover is five hundred million pounds a year, which is roughly what Man United is, we'll multiply it by six, and that's your valuation. Hmm. That's your valuation. Find someone to come along and pay three billion for Manchester United, and that's the real valuation. Yeah. But they've got yeah. a stock market listing which gives them a market cap of two and a half billion. But yes, of course, what it does is it gives you a feel of a blue chip. It gives you a feel of certainly in the financial world as well, because it gives you more gravitas. It's a badge it, of honour, in other words. To some extent, yeah. So, so if yeah. you drop like United from three to four, does that hurt the, the Glazers in any way? Well, it depends what it does to their share price, because their share price is underpinning a large proportion of what Manchester United are worth. Manchester United's, share, Manchester United's market cap is 2.7 billion. Then you pile on top the debt that they owe, because there's a whole raft of calculations that come to film evaluation. Yeah, but reputationally, will it hurt them? Um, no, not really. You've just seen them do another deal. They've, they've done another deal for a shirt sponsor. Um, that they've got 235 million quid for. It was less than the Chevrolet, Chevrolet deal, but they've also can use another part of the property, so that it would end up being more for their shirt sponsorship. So seemingly, no. But the, the idea that these valuations... One of the key valuations that they're basing it upon most recently is Liverpool selling 10% of Fenway... Oh, yeah. To, to, the the private, to private equity firms, yeah. right? But that's a, that's a more sophisticated way of doing something. They're, they're carving out 10% of Liverpool's revenue, dropping it into a, a, a model that then gets floated on the stock market at 20 times its earnings. So paying six times something for a business turnover is the economics of a slightly immature industry, but it gives a broad brush perspective. Now, if you look at Man United and you look at Barcelona and you look at Real Madrid and those clubs that... And United have been in the... United and Real Madrid... Have been the ones that have been sort of, ju you know, yeah, jousting for position, jousting for yeah. position over the last four or five years. Yeah. United falling out of the Champions League, um, uh, I think in 1920 they weren't in the Champions League in 1920. They were in the Europa League, um, so they would have lost 30, 40, 50 million pounds of a turnover there. Will of course have an impact, and of course it's part and parcel. When you're talking about big hitters, mm. let's let's be clear: the turnover of football clubs is tiny, minuscule, absolutely. They're not even the size of a medium-sized business in, in, in the UK because they are small businesses in turnover terms. £500 million pounds a year, which is Manchester United's turnover, is nothing compared to the big businesses of the world that have global brands. But because of the reach of these businesses, because of the way they touch other people's businesses, because yeah, yeah. Nike can be Nike can sell billions of pounds of a yes, kit by off the back of it. So yeah. yes, you're right yeah. to say, is it about positioning? Because if United have another opportunity to say, we are the number one best-valued club in the world, of course it then knocks on to their commercial ability to be able to say For to sure. Chevron, look at us, yeah. we're the biggest club in look world football, where we because are look, look at the value of us. How does this work though, Simon? Forbes are saying that despite the pandemic, and with the pandemic, we have been talking ad infinitum about doom and gloom yep. in, the, in, the, yep. in the world of football. Clubs worth in the top 20 have increased by 30%. Because of the way football's being looked at by the finance market now, if you look at what has happened with Fenway, I talked about something about six months ago, but when the Football League, you know, the EFL, were going to sell 10% of their media rights, 20% of their media rights, the 350 million quid for one of the biggest private equity firms. They were going to take that, 
put it into a model, float it at 20 times the money and make a billion quid off their ownership of 20% of the EFL. The exact same things happen with Fenway. If you've bought 10% of Fenway for 500 million quid, then you've just upped the ante on the way football looks. But the reasons why they're doing it is they're taking sports media rights, dropping them into other rappers and making money that way. But what it does is have a knock-on effect to the valuation of certain fo certain football clubs. Not every football club, certain football clubs. You know, if you look down the pyramid and look at clubs that are being sold and bought now, they're being nicked. They're not being sold for, for, for the dough that people have paid for them. The, you know, I, I suspect that Aston Villa weren't mm. sold for anything near the investment mm. that Tony Zaya put in there and so on and so forth. But it's interesting because it, it's, it makes good headlines. But behind it, when you see somebody come along, the Glazers did not pay three billion for Man United. No, they no, paid five hundred million quid, yeah. of which uh, most of it was Man United's own money. When you see somebody come along and pay three or four billion pounds for a football club, then these valuations, besides um, being very good to look at in paper and in yeah. principle valuations for yeah. other businesses to utilise, aren't really real. They're not really well. You're not going to see someone pay three and a half billion pounds for Man United. You said earlier that you hated being on the rich list. You hated seeing your, yeah, your, your name on it. I did. But uh, there is something in this badge of honour thing, surely, is there not? You must have loved that a bit. It depends if you're living your because life. Because if you didn't, you wouldn't be driving a Maserati, you wouldn't be wearing no, your drive, smart suits I, I, and what have I you. I drive a nice car because I do it for me. I don't do it for to live vicariously through other people's eyes. My successes or lack of them were mine to own or to, to cherish or to value in the way that I wanted to. Did your wealth make you arrogant? No. It, it, it made me uh, have a, a value of nicer things in life and access to them and appreciative of them. Um, and aware of having a better bottle of wine than one I could have previously afforded or having a nicer car. I never saw the idea that the nobility was being a billionaire driving a Nissan. Hmm. I wanted to be... Not that I was a billionaire. I, want, <laughs> I wanted to drive a nice car. I know, but you said that you, you really didn't like... You didn't like reading your, about yourself. You didn't pay much attention to the no, fact that you were in no the rich list. Business. And that you can precisely remember the number you were on the rich list. Yeah, because I was outraged. <laughs> what, I, you think you should have been higher up? No, I was outraged I was there in the first place, and it was inaccurate as well. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was it? Were, did they no, pitch they, you too high or too low? No, they attributed far too... I mean, the first time I ever put me in, I actually went down to the cash point machine to see if I had more money than I thought I had, because it was so inaccurate. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody get Forbes on the blower, would they? Uh, Simon, times. thanks for that. Uh, remember, Tesco Mobile for Business. Small businesses can save up to 40% in the phone bills for applicable terms and verification. See tescomobile.com slash business.